Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, I hope you've all had a good lunch. So Jim Halloran, who is O'Halloran, sorry, who is standing behind me, is a uh, part software developer, part sysadmin, DevOps architect and teacher who has spent the last six years working on Magento. Uh, he's going to show us how to cache pages with personalized content. Uh, with personalization at scale, a cookie cutter approach, please make Jim welcome. Thank you. So today what I want to talk about is how do we cache pages, particularly using full page caches, so that we can achieve high performance, fast responsive websites and retain some of the personalization content that customers and users expect. So an alternate topic for this could be why there's about half a dozen things in that screenshot that are going to make that page not cacheable. And then how do we fix that? Um, so just briefly, I've been uh, working in various capacities, software development and so on for about 20 plus years. Since LCA in 2004, everything I've done has kind of had an open source bent to it and that's included teaching and web development and various sort of mixed roles. And the last six years of that I've been working as a senior developer at Allegiant Consulting, which is kind of been a bit of a jack of all trades thing, sysadmin DevOps and so on, full stack development. Um, before I launch in, who, can I get a show of hands, who's heard of Magento? Good, that's more people than I expected. And who's actually used it? Three more people than I thought, awesome. So, um, today really the focus is more on the front end, so the full page case and so on in front of Magento, rather than Magento itself. So, Expecting that not a lot of people have probably heard of or used Magento, I thought we'll just lay a bit of a groundwork as to you know, what it is we're talking about, why we need to do the things we need to do, but hopefully the techniques and so on I'll present in this presentation will be applicable for other CMSs, you know, WordPress or Drupal or something that's not just Magento. Um, so how do we get into this situation? Magento is extensible. The core Magento architects have built a framework that values extensibility, pluggability, flexibility. So there are built-in mechanisms in Magento that allow you to plug into, change, replace, outright disable most parts of the core Magento framework. All of this extensibility and flexibility comes at a cost, and that cost is complexity. So Magento is a highly architected piece of software. There's a lot of things the Java developer would be used, familiar with, design patterns and so on. But it's all written in PHP, which is an interpreted language, and interpreted languages come with their own performance baggage. All of this extensibility and flexibility also makes it complex. So there are great big lumps of XML wiring together all of the components. If you have a Magento site with a large number of modules installed, that's potentially hundreds of XML files that need to be parsed and put together on every page load. Um, consequently, Magento kind of has a reputation for being slow. Not surprising. Uh, it doesn't have to be. If you are careful about how you select modules and how you put things together and so on, you can achieve a very performant Magento site. However, the reputation still persists. So why is performance important? This is an old graph now from Walmart from 2012. And what it shows is the bar chart is proportion of traffic served in various response times, and the line is conversion rate. So conversion rate are the number of user sessions that translate into actual purchases. And you can see that as the response time for the page increases, conversion rate drops off dramatically. I think the most remarkable thing about this graph is just how quickly it drops off. So conversion rate on pages served in one to two seconds is half zero to one seconds. So it drops off dramatically. And obviously for the business, the better the website converts, the more value we extract from the existing traffic and the capacity we have to serve that traffic. So we can either go out and get more traffic, and that can be through SEO or advertising or whatever, and convert at the same rate, or if we can increase conversions, it's almost free money. 
performance optimization is one way that we can do that. And a faster site that converts better also can handle more capacity, more traffic. So Magento is a pretty standard LAMP stack kind of application. Um, PHP, MySQL, Nginx, or Apache. Um, because of all of the XML parsing and so on that Magento does behind the scenes, it also has built in a fairly mature caching architecture for caching a lot of this XML so it doesn't have to be dealt with on every single page load. Instead of putting together hundreds of XML files, merging them together and using them, it caches the output and just loads that. So consequently, most Magento sites that perform any kind of scale also then have Redis or Memcache as a caching backend. And I think that's a fairly common architecture for a lot of other sites as well. So again, you know, your CMS sites, your Drupal's, your WordPress, that kind of thing. What we find specifically with Magento though is once we get into that sort of situation and caching everything is working nicely, database is tuned nicely and so on, our remaining bottleneck then ends up being the app server. It becomes CPU bound. It spends all of its time loading uh, content from the database, parse it, figuring out the layout instructions of this page, assembling pages from blocks, rendering content, routing requests. And this takes up a lot of CPU time. Now, one of the things that comes into play here is a thing known as the Pareto Principle. Pareto Principle says that 80% of your effects come from about 20% of your causes. Oftentimes, that's in business terms phrases, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your products. This same effect is kind of known as the long tail. A small number of products contribute a large portion of a business's sales. So if the vast majority of our sales and therefore our traffic through our website comes from a small number of products and the small number of categories that they may be in, it stands to reason that a lot of the CPU activity that is spent generating pages when we get to this point is actually repetitive. We're generating the same page for the same products over and over again. Sounds like a job for caching, right? So the next logical step, and this is kind of where we start to get into the meat of the talk, is to add full page caching. So if our app server is spending all of its time generating these pages, it's doing the work repeatedly, the content is basically the same for everyone, how about we cache that? And so full page caching, and I'm going to talk a lot about Varnish today, but this applies equally to Section IO, which is kind of a, a geographically distributed Varnish as a service, Cloudflare or any of the other sort of modern CDN edge cache things. Um, so full page caching is generally deployed as a reverse proxy in front of the website. Request comes in. If it's in cache, response goes straight out. We don't need to talk to app servers. If it's not in cache, we proxy it then to an app server and get the response back. If the app server says we're allowed to cache it, we'll store it in cache so that the next person who asks for that product page or category can get a cache result very quickly. Now, the really nice thing about Varnish is it's fast. So if you try and benchmark a Varnish server that is serving only cache hits, it's really hard to get meaningful data, right? So cache hits come back in sort of single digit milliseconds. It will serve them pretty much as fast as your network will allow. It's kind of hard to actually really test, but it's an enormous difference between a varnish cache hit and potentially several hundred milliseconds for a full page render through Magento. So we want to use full page cache to cache our results as much as we can. And we need to be aware that there's a significant time difference between cache hits and cache misses, which are going to be considerably slow. Because of this, getting a high hit rate out of Varnish is, or any of your full page caches is very important. So we want to try and serve as many pages from cache as we possibly can. 
So what we want to do there is try and avoid things like, well, if the customer logs in and we start having to show them some slightly different content, we don't want to just exclude them from Varnish because they're going to get a relatively poor experience, slow page loads constantly. It's also going to damage our hit rate, generate more load on app servers and so on. One of the other things that's important to realize, and I'll come back to this over and over again during this talk, is that there are page loads that we cannot cache. There are cacheable requests and uncacheable requests. The cacheable requests are not modifying our server state at all. So the cacheable requests are things like a load for a product page, a load for a blog article, um, where we're not modifying anything on the server. We're just simply retrieving content and regurgitating it back to the user. Uncacheable requests are going to be things like a login, where you know, we'd need to actually modify the state and record that you have logged in. So caching, it's either the problem or the solution, right? So I said at the beginning that there's a whole bunch of things in that little screenshot that would break full page cache. And then I've just spent the last few minutes explaining why we have to use full page cache to get Magento to perform. So how do we fix those things that we said we couldn't cache? So that's the same screenshot in context now showing the specific things that I was referring to. So things like the welcome message at the top that includes my name, the cart me uh, message that has a number next to it that indicates how many items I've got in my cart. Um, the menu item also includes the number of items I've got in the cart. And the one I've highlighted at the bottom is maybe not so obvious, but it's showing a logout link because I'm logged in. If I wasn't logged in, that would say log in, and there would also be a register link. The other thing, the things that we commonly run into are things like, you know, a lot of retailers say spend $50 and we'll give you free shipping. So they want to show on every page in the header, you know, you have $20 worth of product in your cart, spend another $30 and you'll get free shipping. That's obviously personalized content because it's related to the value of the product in your cart. So how do we get around this? Varnish would be a very limited full page cache if it didn't have built in some mechanism for dealing with this. And so what Varnish gives us and what Nginx will do for us as well if you're using that as a proxy server is a thing called an edge site include. And edge site includes is essentially some special markup that we can insert into a page where request comes into Varnish, it sees the page in cache, it will see the markup for this ESI, the edge site include, and it will make a request back to our backend app server to get the content that it wants to insert into that position in the page. And then once it's completely assembled the page with all of the ESIs, it will return that back to the user. Now, one of the immediate problems here is that if you need to have multiple ESI requests to insert multiple pieces of personalized content, they actually run in series, right? They're not requested in parallel at all. The issue there is Magento is going to need to spin up its framework, route the request, assemble a page layout to render your little piece of content. And that all takes time. And you do that two or three times with two or three separate ESIs, and you start to actually eliminate most of the value of using Varnish in the first place. We could, instead of having multiple little ESIs, we could have one request that pulls in much of the header content. But then that starts becoming, again, a larger piece of content to render a slower page load. Um, <clears throat> so if we're doing a lot of ESI requests through Varnish, then this actually eliminates a lot of the value of using full page caching in Varnish at all. It also is still, for every page load, sending a request to your app server, you still have some involvement from your app servers through the whole thing. If a caching was perfect, then a cache hit shouldn't have a request to the app server at all. Remember, we're trying to do this because our app servers are CPU bound. We want to take load off of our app servers. If we continue to pass requests through to them through ESI, then that's problematic. So 
if we don't do ESI, then another common approach is to say, well, let's do this as an AJAX request. Instead of doing it multiple requests in series as ESIs, we could either fire off multiple AJAX requests in parallel, or maybe do one AJAX request and have some JavaScript to split that out and put in the several separate pages. The problem is that this has a lot of the same disadvantages of ESI. We're still connecting to our app server repeatedly, uh, or at least once for every page load. We're not taking the load away from app servers the way we wanted to. The other problem that we've run into is that now we've added a full round trip of network latency between our customer and the website on every page load. So oftentimes you'll see the page come up and then a noticeable delay a second or two before things like the welcome message fill in. And that's not a great user experience. Another thing we could do is say, well, there's certain pages that are going to be hard to cache. There's certain customers that are hard to cache. These are customers who have logged in or have added items to their cart. Given that that's not everyone, how about we just don't cache for these people, right? And it's a really easy approach because we turn off, someone adds an item to the cart, we turn off Magento for them. All of the extensions, plugins for Magento, sorry, we turn off full page cache for them. All of the plugins for Magento that allow us to make pages, pages cacheable through Varnish allow us to turn off cache for particular customers. Sounds really easy, we just let Magento be Magento and personalise the pages once it needs to. Problem, what if a large portion of your customers are always logged in when they're browsing? What if you're doing a private sales site that's only for logged in customers? So we've got one uh, customer, for example, who routinely half of the traffic is people who are logged in. If we turn off varnish and full page caching for all of them, that's half of their customers who get a poor experience. Um, so that's not great either. And you know, another approach to all of this is, well, can we just avoid the problem entirely? What about we just design out, you know, get our front end designers, just design out all of these personalization features. You know, that welcome message, who reads it anyway, right? Get rid of it. How about we just always show, um, you know, a My Account link and they'll just prompt you to log in if you're not logged in or, and, you know, who ever logs out anyway? But the problem is that customers kind of expect to see those features. If you want to log into a website, you can't, you're kind of trained through convention to look for a login link in the header. So just getting rid of this stuff and solving the problem by avoiding it entirely is not great either. So take a step back for a second. What are we trying to solve? And all of the approaches we've just talked about are kind of naive. They're kind of saying, we've got a number. We need to stick it in this point in the page. How do we do that? You know, we'll do it through ESI. We'll load it through AJAX or something like that. If we take a step back for a second and think carefully about what it is we're trying to achieve, a few insights kind of unfold and hopefully that leads to a different solution. So things that you notice, some requests are inherently uncacheable because they modify state. You log in, it changes your session state. You add an item to your cart, it changes your cart state. Yeah, you've got items in it, those kinds of things. And the back-end app server always needs to receive those requests. They can't be cached because we need to modif make those modifications to our state on the back-end. If someone submits a login form and we send back a cache res response saying, you're logged in, all good, and the app server never actually sees a request and never actually logs you in, you've actually not done anything. So requests that change state are inherently uncacheable. And changes to the personalised content occur because state has been modified somehow. You've logged in, therefore we should show you your name and a logout link. So anything that's going to change our personalised content is not actually going to happen on a request that we could cache in the first place. Right. So the other thing is that unless a state modification occurs, the personalization information doesn't actually change, right? So the welcome message at the top never changes unless I log in or I go to my account and I change my name. 
the number of items in my cart doesn't change until I add something to my cart uh, or I go into my cart page and change, delete, delete an item. So if we put all this together, we arrive uh, at what we call cookie cutter. So ESI and other techniques are often called hole punching. We're punching a hole into the cached page in order to insert some content. So we came up with a technique that we call cookie cutter where essentially we are punching a hole into a cache page in which we are going to insert some content in a cookie um, or from a cookie. So whenever one of these events occurs that changes our personalization state, then we record the new state in a cookie, we send it with that response, that response can't be cached, and then we have some JavaScript in the top of the page that inserts that into the page and makes it look like the page was always served that way. The content that's served from cache contains you know, a login and a logout link. It's not personalized for any particular user. It has an empty placeholder where the welcome message is. You know, it has hard-coded zero items in cart and we'll override all of those things with JavaScript when the page is loaded from cache. So let's walk through a couple of examples just so I can see how that works. So first of all, I go to the home page of a website. Home page is a pretty popular page. It's probably cached in Varnish. It may or may not be. Who knows? Doesn't matter. As a anonymous user, I'm not going to have a personalization cookie. So the JavaScript in the top of the page is basically going to make sure that this is set up to show me you know, register and login links and show me that I have no items in my cart. As I continue to browse around the site, maybe I go to click on the login link and go to login. When I post the login form, the server is going to have to modify my state on the back end to know that I've logged in. And this, because it's modifying state, is not something that we can cache. So our personalization code intercepts the response to this and adds a cookie to it that includes a little snippet of JSON that just indicates Jim's now logged in and this is his name. And Magento has kind of an unusual behavior in that when you log in, it will usually re 302 redirect you to the home page. And when we get there, our browser is going to have a personalization cookie. We'll get the home page. This time it's definitely coming from cache. How do we know it's definitely coming from cache? We were there a minute ago. If it wasn't in cache before, we caused it to be inserted into cache. So this is going to be a cache load and quite fast. Our browser has the personalization cookie from the login post request. And what we're going to do now is read that in the, some JavaScript in the top of every page, hide the links that are only for logged out users, show what is only for logged in, and update my name in the welcome message at the top. As I continue to browse around the site, if I add a product to cart, this is you know, much more of the same. We're modifying my cart state. This is not something we can cache. We'll in, again intercept the response to that. We'll add a cart count now to a cookie. Magento will 302 redirect me back to the product page. And this time, we will again go through the same personalization stuff, hide the login link, etc. And this time, we'll also update the number of items at the top of the page. So I believe this approach has a number of advantages. We can retain all of the personalization features that Magento offers out of the box. We can start to add things like, you know, $20, spend 20 more dollars to get free shipping, but we can still continue to use full page cache. Um, and we can continue to use that as the customer engages more deeply with our site. We don't get into a situation where customers browsing around, things are really, really fast, they add something to the cart, the site throw, sl show, slows dramatically because we've just dropped them off cache and then you know, they have a bad experience and decide not to finish their purchase. We also avoid making a request to our back-end app servers on every page load, right? So we're not making ESI requests to plug this into every page load. We're not making an AJAX request to get the data all the time. So we have the data in the browser through the cookie and we just render it into the page as we required. 
And because the browser already has the data, there's no AJAX request write latency. So, okay, we're using cookies really extensively. How big can a cookie be? And this turns out to be not an easy question to answer, right? So anyone who's done any significant amount of web development will know that what the standards document says and what the reality in the browsers is, is often very different. This is one of those cases. So according to RFCs, we can have at least 4K of data in at least 50 cookies in at least 3,000, 50 cookies for my domain, at least 3,000 in total. Um, I wish that was the case. Um, the note down the bottom there, also a quote from the RFC, servers should use as few and as small cookies as possible is still good advice, right? We've got to send these cookies back to the server on every request. We want to make them as small as we can. So reality, it's complicated. Every browser does it differently. The exact limits, the exact numbers are different in most browsers. As time has gone on though, it seems like this is getting better. Most browsers now seem to have coalesced around about a 4096 byte limit, so about 4K. There are some older browsers though that will have a 4K limit for an individual cookie plus 4K in total across all of the cookies for a particular domain. And there's a link there if you want to look at the gory detail, but like I said, it's complicated. So I spent a lot of time pointing out all of the issues with the other approaches. I think it's probably only fair that I go through and kind of try and poke holes in this and tell you when you probably shouldn't use it. And the one that I've already sort of hinted at is cookie size. So we want to try and keep the cookies small because they're going to go back to the server on every request. Bandwidth in Australia is uh, suboptimal. And certainly upstream bandwidth going back to the server is the worst case scenario. So we want to try and make that cookie as small as we possibly can because that's going to have a significant impact on you know, our request response speed. Um, the other thing that we can do is all of our static assets, our images, our JavaScript and so on, we can serve via a CDN and put it on a different host name so we don't have to send that cookie at all. So, we can partially avoid it with a CDN. We can work around it by keeping it small. But um, at the end of the day, there are still going to be some larger sections of the page that we can't just stash into a cookie. So if a customer has a lot of items in their cart, by the time we include a hyperlink and the name and the price and an image and a quantity for every single one of them, we're going to blow through that 4K limit pretty quickly. So one of the things we can do is, again, Ajaxing content. Again, has some of the same issues that I mentioned before. The reason why I think that's a viable option here is that we don't necessarily show like a drop-down mini card on every page load. It's only there when the customer clicks on it. So we only make the Ajax request when they need it. Um, we have, we being Allegiant, have open sourced a module that we call an FPC friendly mini cart that does exactly that. Uh, and there's a link there for that on GitHub. Um, another possible issue is information leakage. So I said before that the content, the page that is served from the rendered and served from has to contain content for both logged in and logged out users because we're going to cache it and serve it to both. And this approach is going to leak those URLs so that the customer who's logged out and views source is going to see the link to my account and things that might only be applicable for uh, logged in customers. Um, Magento is open source though. So like my account and so on, the URLs are there, they're in source code, they're public, they're not secret anyway. And most of these pages are uncacheable, they're going to need some state, you know, the, when you're viewing your dashboard page in your my account section, it needs to load all of your name and address details from the database. So they're uncacheable, the back end is still going to 
validate whether or not you're logged in if you go directly to that URL. Obviously, if there's some truly sensitive content that you can't afford to have leak out, then we, you know, this isn't going to be a viable approach. And again, you know, loading that via AJAX, validating login state on the AJAX request is an option there. Um, then we get into large scale changes. So you get the site that says, I don't want pricing to be visible in China. That's actually a rule requirement that we had once. Um, how do we make those pages cacheful? How do we actually deal with full page cache when things like the country you're in change the content? Again, it's probably not something we can deal with with just a cookie-based approach. Um, and, you know, or another example is customer that does retail and trade pricing. So log in as a trade customer, you get a discounted price. Usually uh, companies are a little bit sensitive about their trade price being public information, so we don't want to serve a page that has both prices in it and show and hide the appropriate price through JavaScript. In these cases, one approach that we've used really successfully is a very header in the response. And very is a header that you can include in your HTTP response that says, my cache should store different versions of this URL for different values of this header in the request. So if I sent back a, a very header in my response, it said very colon user agent, my cache, my proxy in front of that would then store different versions of this page for different user agents. So back in the, uh, the bad old days when we used to do browser detection rather than feature detection, where you'd say, if IE6, then this, if some same browser, do something else, then um, we could use that to say, store different cache objects for different user agents, different browsers, because they're going to have different results. And we can do a similar kind of thing with the GOP thing that I was talking about a minute ago, where if we have a GOP module in Varnish, and they do exist, we can figure out what country the customer is in, insert a country header into their request, and then say to Varnish on the result, vary this depending on what country they're in. So when the customer in China gets the, you're blocked, sorry, page, that's not served to the rest of the world. Form keys. So anyone who's done any Magento development probably loves or hates these, probably hates. Um, form keys is what Magento calls its CSRF protection, so cross-site request forgery. The issue here is that the token that it uses for form key validation is going to be stored in the cache page. It may not match, or it probably won't match the one that is in your session. <clears throat> um, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Stick it in the cookie, replace it with JavaScript, make it line up that way. Um, <clears throat> for various th reasons that are kind of Magento specific though, that's harder than it sounds. And I won't get into the details, but um, <clears throat> our implementation of the personalization cookie stuff does deal with it successfully. Um, it just, like I said, turns out to be harder than you'd think. So cache misses. So, if we're talking, we spent all this time trying to optimize our customer experience by make it, keeping them in the cache happy path for as long as we possibly can. The moment they request a page, though, that's not going to be cacheable or not um, cached in Varnish already, they're still going to get a bad experience. So improving caching and improving performance through full page caching is great, but um, there's this potential once someone goes off the beaten path to have a bad experience. So this is kind of where I'm going to delve into some more Magento-specific stuff, uh, but bear with me. So Magento uh, assembles all of its pages from a large number of blocks. So a lot of templates, a lot of individual blocks, um, and then serves the final result back to the customer. Um, 
And the block structure is very deeply nested and fairly complex. It's part of how Magento achieves its extensibility. So this is a page rendered uh, through a tool called Advanced Template Hints that actually lets you see the block structure. So you can see here that for our product, you know, there's a huge number of blocks. Just the price alone is a block. Um, if you want to make a Magento front-end developer shutter, mention the words price.phtml to them. That is a remarkably complex template that no one wants to touch. Um, so the, the modularity and how assembling these pages from blocks is how Magento achieves a lot of the extensibility and so on we talked about before. So can we apply some of the same ideas here? So a lot of the parts of the page are relatively unchangeable. So the navigation, the header and so on, the price down on a product, for example, can we go about caching a lot of those individual pieces? Magento has a thing called a block cache that's designed to do exactly that. It's really underutilized by default. So this screenshot that I showed a minute ago, the significance of all of the red there is that those blocks are not actually being cached in the block cache, right? So we came up with a thing that we call Cache Observer that basically goes through and, again, hooks into the rendering process for a page and adds cache tags to a lot of blocks that we think should be cacheable. And when you do that, you find that a remarkable amount of this now turns green. So the green is blocks that are explicitly being cached. The yellow are implicitly cached, so they're inside something that is being cached, so it will be cached along with. And we find that this makes a big difference to performance. So um, Cache Observer, you probably saw the link as we went through, again, is something that we've also open sourced. So. Um, it's a good, you know, easy win for some performance improvements in Magento. So the block cache, um, one of the things that we found is that when you can't see the deeply nested structure for the blocks, you have no visibility into it, it's really hard to actually even visualise the structure and see what's going on. We found that the AOE template hints, the advanced template hints module I talked about before, was really great for getting the visibility. It's great as a front end developer to say, what template is just giving me that content? There's all kinds of mouse overs and so on as you go around the page. Um, but the key takeaway from that is that we found is if you can't see it, you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? Once we could see all the red boxes on the page, we could then start to look at, well, are some of these cacheable? Can we improve this? So advanced type template hints is a really useful tool for uh, Magento developers to help see into some of the structure. Um, obviously, everything I've talked about now so far is caching, right? Caching is not performance optimization. It's really wallpapering over the underlying issues. So uh, what's happening there is, you know, we're trying to get more and more things cached, trying to get things more and more things through cache hits. But when you get a cache miss, when you get a checkout page which is not cacheable at all, we're not helping. So at this point, it's really time to break out the profiler and do some old school. Uh, profiling and performance optimization to try and improve things. Um, a couple of tools that we found really useful are New Relic for just seeing where the hotspots are in production. So New Relic's a commercial product. Um, and the AOE profile extension is, again, another open source extension from AOE, which is a Magento agency in Europe, um, that actually gives you some visibility into the hotspots in your individual pages. So everything I've talked about today is available for Magento 1, is open source. It's been up on GitHub for quite a while. 
Uh, so the varnish implantation quickie cutter is part of a modification that we've made to a Phoenix varnish cache module, so it's on GitHub. Cache Observer, which is the block cache enhancement I was talking about, is also on GitHub as well. So if you're doing Magento work, feel free to check those out. So they are both from Magento 1. Um, just briefly, Magento 2 has been around for a little while now. Adoption's kind of problematic. Um, Magento 2 has native varnish support. It will do things like ESI for certain content. It will Ajax load certain content. Um, a dead giveaway for a Magento 2 site that's using varnish uh, and the native implementation is you land on the page and the navigation is completely non-existent until it Ajaxes in a couple of seconds later. Right? That's not ideal. So we think cookie cutter and this technique that I've been talking about has some relevance for Magento 2. There just isn't an existing implementation just yet. I um, also think that the same problem applies or a lot of other CMS sites and so on that are trying to do full page caching are going to have similar problems. So I think the, the key takeaway I want you to leave this with today is really the idea of what we've done and how we've gone about it and you know, maybe given you a tool that you can use to solve some of your own problems even if they're not Magento. Um, something else, we've been doing cookie cutter for a while now. Since we started that, local storage is a thing now. So we can actually store data in the browser and not have it sent back to the server on every request. This gives us some relief from size limitations. We don't have the bloat on the request where we send back something every time. But we're going to need to have some sort of you know, our own expiry mechanism uh, to, to dispose of the personalization cookie. So that's something that we've considered but haven't implemented yet. Um, so I think the, the key thing really that, to take away is the techniques and that you need to think carefully when you're doing, dealing with full page caching about the impacts that this is going to have on uh, your site and your pages. Varnish is not something we can just turn on, right? That comes with some other limitations. So hopefully this has been a useful introduction to our technique for cookie cutting. Um, and that's all I have for you. So is there any questions? I've got about two minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, sorry. Um, so the question was, so do you only send the cookie once when the post goes in? And yes. Um, so the customer logs in and we recognise that their login state and their name and those kinds of things aren't going to change until they do something else to change that. So we don't need to send the cookie back on every subsequent response. And we probably don't want to because if the, they happen to run into a product page that was previously not cached, we don't want to cache that cookie in with the in Varnish because Varnish will cache the entire headers and content of the response. So we send it back once and then it, the browser will just persist it until it expires. Yep. Any others? Yep. Okay, thank you very much.